was the night before Christmas when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney of care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be here. In 1822, this poem, Twas Night for Christmas, was written by Clement Moore, and it basically molded the modern American Santa Claus. It highlighted his rosy cheeks, his bowl full of jelly, his belly full of jelly, his uh, reindeer drawn sleigh, and his jolly spirit. But the concept of Santa Claus has been around a lot longer than only 200 years, and in many different countries than our own. Um, like most of us in here, I grew up around Santa Claus. Uh, you know, you see the movies, you see the books, you know the story. But I recently came aware that there are a lot of different versions of Santa Claus or different Santa figures. So today, and they're not always jolly, and they're not always just one character. So today I want to compare for you the cultural differences of Santa or Santa figures from around the world, looking at the origin, their traditions, and the way they look. So. Hit the hit the left button. That's the wrong leg. Let's go back one. I wouldn't do that. Okay. Let's go the wrong way. So I had to go. I, like the first picture, I didn't put black one. So I put black, and I have to go back to the first picture. But well, then you go to hit previous. Go to previous. Left button. If you've been in this country for one Christmas, you know who Santa Claus is everywhere. But I want to go over who our Santa Claus has to thank who he is today. So, according to the St. Nicholas Center, uh, St. Nicholas was born in the 3rd century, which is now the border of Greece and Turkey. And he was very wealthy, but his parents, when they were really young, passed away. So, raised as a devout Christian, he followed Jesus' commandments by donating his entire inheritance to the sick, the needy, and the poor. Um, and since then, he started doing a lot of generous deeds and became known for his generosity and love of children. Uh, he became known as the Bishop of Myra and, and then traveled around. Um, when he passed away on December 6th, there was a, a substance that actually, well, supposedly a Christian legend, there was a substance that formed over his grave, which supposedly had magic powers, which helped create the following of the St. Nicholas. Uh, some of the legends that have highlighted his, gener his generosity have turned into the traditions we have today for our Santa Claus. For example, uh, there was a man who had three daughters, but he couldn't afford the dowry because he was very poor. Uh, because he was poor. And in those days, if you couldn't pay for the dowry, they'd be sold into prostitution, they wouldn't get married, they'd be forced to be slaves. So on three different occasions, St. Nicholas took a bag of gold, tossed it through an open window, and landed in the socks and shoes by the fire, which led to the tradition of hanging up your stockings by the fire to get presents. Um, before, around the 19th century, uh, Santa Claus was depicted wearing red, blue, green, purple, or any kind of color that was associated with the seasons. But, but Coca-Cola establishes himself as creating the uh, red and white combination. Um, in actuality, a lot of the way we see Santa has been come from the visual renditions of him. So, this is a painting from 1810, which talks about, which shows St. Nicholas in his like Pope stuff, giving the children the presents. This is from, I think, eight. Still 19th century, this is by Thomas Nast. He is the next kind of generation. Then we have, um, this is Norman Rockwell from 1921. This is kind of the introduction of the red and white, but then uh, Coca-Cola did their advertisements from the 1930s and 40s, which established it, like, for sure, in American minds. So the next one, the first one I want to talk about, like, besides our actual kind of cause, is the Russian one. His name is Dead Moros. Um, he's from Russia, and he's the closest kind of to ours that I could find, really. But his story of origin is really different because originally he was came from um, an evil sorcerer, 
He would kidnap children, he'd freeze them, and then have to, they'd have to pay ransom to get them back. Um, through the influence of Christian cultures, he became more generous and nice and started giving children presents on New Year's Day for Eve. But after the Russian Revolution, uh, he was seen as too Christian-like, and general, uh, Christmas in general was too Christian. So um, it wasn't until about 1937 when Dead Rose was actually reintroduced to the Russian culture. But at that point, Stalin decided that he needed to be wearing blue instead of red to um, separate him from the Christian, you know, Santa Claus. Uh, he became a large part of their celebration, and he has a snowman. Her name is Snertwitcha, and she's actually uh, his granddaughter in a lot of the legends. He's usually shown wearing the long traditional style coat, the headgear which is round instead of tall, and he's pulled by three horses instead of reindeers. The next one is very, very different. This is Krampus. Um, he is the German alter ego Santa, kind of. Like, instead of having just one person, they have a Krampus who delivers all the punishments to the evil children. And according to Krampus.com, he is hellbound and uh, directly under the control of Santa Claus. Uh, he would go through the town looking for the naughty children. He'd, he'd terrorize them, he'd hit them with sti sticks, he'd hit them with chains, and then stick them in baskets and take them to hell for being naughty. It's from a pre-Christian era, obviously, and uh, based off European Alpine folklore. Um, he is, looks like a traditional devil, the long red tongue, the hooves, the uh, fur, but in also different legends, he is shown as a sinister-looking evil man, so like a direct alter ego of Santa, who is jolly, and this one is evil-looking. Um, in some places before, they people the towns would invite Krampus to come, and he would walk the towns and scare children. He'd knock at doors at night and scare the children again. But after the Inquisition, it was actually um, punishable by death to imitate a demon. But a lot of the remote towns were able to keep it going for a while. And by the 17th century, it kind of like came back and has spread through other countries, such as like Germany, um, Switzerland, Austria. And they even had their very own, America had their own very own Krampus Day, I think, a couple years ago. Do you want that? Okay. Um, so, and then in Iceland, they have the Yule Lads. So instead of one character or a direct alter ego to Santa, they have 13 different characters. And according to the um, National Icelandic Museum, they are 17th century legends, and they are, these 13 sons are the sons of two really hideous, mean trolls. And in 1946, originally they were used as like a fear mechanism for the people, but in 1746, there was a public decree that forbade the use of them as like a fear tactic. So uh, over time they became more uh, generous and they gave presents to children, but they still maintained their mischievous ways. Um, the names are Sheep Clock Claude, Golly Gox, Stubby, Spoon Licker, Pot Scraper, Bull Licker, <laughs> Door Slammer, Sky Robber, Sasha Swiper, Window Peeker, Door Sniffer, Meat Hook, and Candle Beggar, which basically shows how they be mischievous. So instead of annoying children, they would give, be kind and give them presents. And starting on December 12th to the 24th, the children would take their shoes, put them on the windows, and every night, one different uh, Yule Lad would put a present in their shoe. So by the end of the night, or by the end of the month, they'd have 13 gifts, but if they were naughty, they'd get potatoes. <laughs> um, so basically, the Denmaros, Krampus, and the Yule, Yule Lads all have similarities to the American Santa Claus, but their origins and traditions are celebrated by the people are very unique. So maybe next time you will think twice before being naughty or nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not afraid of the moment. 
So, Andrea, what did you think? Um, I think I really like her description in the, description in the intro. It's a, it was a good attention grabber. Also, I think her, her general statement was clear in the beginning, so we knew what the speech was going to be about and what it's going to have. Um, some things that, could, uh, sh that she could work on is maybe setting your sources better. I know you have a lot of information, but I think I only heard two sources. Um, also, I think a good tip will be using flashcards instead of a painter. But overall, I think your speech had a good um, cultural relation to the audience. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not going to disagree with anything that you said. Everything that you said would be, would have been something that I said. <laughs> you know, so you did a good job on that. Uh, see, that's the evaluation of the evaluation. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I like the attention device. I thought the start of the speech was really uh, solid. You've got a good attention device. You've got a very clear statement of what your purpose is. There's an excellent preview of what the material is going to be. Uh, so uh, everything's solid there. In the body of the speech, I did only hear a, you know, a small amount of source citation. I, I, the one specific one I remember was a reference to material from the uh, Icelandic Museum, I think it was. Everything else, I know that you got the information from someplace, but I didn't really hear very frequently where that information came from. Uh, the descriptions are fine. Uh, sometimes they go on uh, in a little bit too much detail. Obviously, you have some time issues, so you're going to have to it would have been ideal to maybe condense down a little bit on some of the things. We get the names of all of the, uh, what are they, the 14 Jolly Lads or? Yule. Yule Lads, Yule Lads, you know, and I'm going, okay, you know, I think a couple of them might have been good, you know, and then maybe talk about what, how, you know, that's related to the gift that they give or, or the mischief that they created or something like that, and then, uh, you know, move through a little bit quicker. And we run into some of the same kinds of things on other issues, too. Um, I tell you what, some of the stories feel like they are, you, you, you're hitting high points, but there's stuff that's missing in between, or it just needs to um, flow a little bit more sl smoothly in the middle of the stories. And I, I think you can feel the editing in your presentation. I can I can see where you you've got pieces of information and they're, they're coming. You know, I, I'm gonna I want to talk about this. I want to talk about this. I want to talk about this. But it's not quite clear how that all fits together. And I think that that needed to be worked on a little bit. Uh, delivery, you needed just a little more practice. Obviously, you need a little practice with the uh, technology issue. That's. One of those things we try to give people a chance to do. Not everybody always takes advantage of that. All right, thank you. I'm just checking to see if anybody else uh, we need to take care of today. I know some people are going to have to roll over to next time, but if I just want to, all right. Thank you. Oh yes. Peer evaluation. So you're worried about what, <laughs> what, what is it? What's the character? You said name? what happened to my paper said Krampus got it. Krampus. Is it Krampus? With a P? Krampus. Krampus is going to come and get you. <laughs>